welcome to this video it's good to have you here and i appreciate that you are here very very much now we're looking at panoricas today i have two of them in my collection and well i wanted to have this video when both of them are in bloom and <laughs> Oops, we just kind of missed the mark with the Panarica Brassavole that is here on the right, and the Prismarta Carpa is the one on the left. When I moved this orchid out to put her on the staging area, I lost about five blooms in one go, and I'm like, yeah, I have really cut it close so that at least the spike is not completely naked, but I bet you if I touch the blooms on that spike, they are going to fall off. So I'm not going to touch them, and we'll see how it goes. But I did film her when she was in her glory, when her blooms were fresh, so I'll be adding that footage, just so that I can show you what a Panarica Brasso Ole spike looks like in full bloom even though this is only the first time she has ever bloomed for me so I'm hoping for more potential as the years go by if she chooses to stay in my collection but how about a genus name that is easy to pronounce Panarica <laughs> makes a nice change from what we are sometimes confronted with. But this genus was also created specifically for only six species that previously were epidendrums, then encyclias, and then prostechias. Finally, after they figured out that there were six species having all the same criteria and makeup that epidendrums, encyclias, and prostechias do not have, they came up with a genus named Panarica because that combines the two locations where these species grow, specifically Panama and Costa Rica at elevations of 900 to 2,500 meters. Meanwhile, they also stretch into Mexico and Nicaragua because, hey, orchids do not have borders. But I do have to say, personal preference is that they didn't include Mexico and Nicaragua into that new genus name because, my goodness, that would have been a mouthful. <laughs> There, where they normally come from, they love a steady humidity of 80% during their growing season. So this is where my setup comes into play because I do not have that kind of humidity here in southern Spain. My yearly humidity averages 30% and even while they prefer a drop in humidity during the winter down to 60% as a minimum, I rarely have extended periods of time with those humidity levels. So let us talk about my setup and why it works for me and could possibly work for you with an alternative for organic media if inorganic media is not how you grow your orchids. Because of their astonishing amount of water consumption and humidity preferences, the LECA and self-watering setup works really well in a dry climate. And here I managed to keep up with their needs. My setup is not a wet-dry cycle, but during the winter, the reservoir does not have any water in it. All I do is flush the pot through with plain water to keep the microfibers damp and maintain the wicking efficacy of the LECA, even if I am fertilizing, but we'll get to that. And seeing as they get super thirsty, an ideal variable for organic media is medium-sized bark with the little perlite included. The medium-sized bark will retain a lot more moisture than if one were to use large bark. If grown in organic media, it is advisable to allow the media to dry out slightly when these orchids are in active growth, but ideally they should not be drying out at all during their active growth. The pseudobulbs will shrivel very quickly if they don't have access to adequate hydration at this time. During the winter, however, keeping the media dry for two to three days before watering again is fine if organic media is your preferred media for growing orchids. Now, since I've had these orchids in my collection, and that would be two years, I have noticed that the Prismata carpa starts its new growth early fall and then it continues to grow out through the winter. And that would be if you're growing in the northern or southern hemisphere. The growth of a new growth will then extend throughout spring into summer, and as it matures, a spike will start to form. And here we are at the end of summer, and she is in full bloom. This is the first time that I see her already starting a new growth late summer, because my fertilizing regime has then changed because of what I'm seeing this orchid do now. I can only fertilize depending on the environment, and what I can provide for both these orchids. In the winter, I couldn't provide steady temperatures and light, and this genus requires consistent access to fertilizer and supplements when they start their new growth. Their structures are large and can get very leggy if the fertilizer amount provided does not match the light levels. So in my past winters, 
my past growths, I fertilized at 160 parts per million while they were forming their new growth because of my circumstances not being ideal and I wanted to avoid the new growth getting leggy and weak. They can easily take double that quantity if their light and temperature levels are within their preferred range and light level balance the amount of fertilizer I was adding and the orchid could then metabolize. And then I really focused on the supplements because their structures need a lot of support. For that reason, when I used to supplement in the winter, I used 150 parts per million of CalMag and 50 parts per million of seaweed. This was purely to support the new growth to grow strong, if not as large as it could grow. But without the high light, I can support the new growth with the calcium, the magnesium, until the weather changed and they could go outside again and then I could really put in the fertilizer and then support that growth. Now, because it's already starting a new growth and we are late summer, I am fertilizing at 300 parts per million and because this orchid is super super thirsty that reservoir is empty within two or three days and before filling the reservoir with another 300 parts per million of fertilizer I flush the pot through twice with the mask as my measure just with plain water. Fill the reservoir with the fertilizer put her back on her shelf. This brings me to the temperatures because just now I talked a lot about temperature and light balance. They are considered cool to warm growers. So their ideal temperatures where they originate are between 13 degrees Celsius and 27 degrees Celsius. Luckily, I can provide those temperatures. However, in my climate, they have to tolerate temperatures up to 40 degrees Celsius on occasions. And as long as they are not exposed to any harsh light and have plenty of airflow, they have no problem dealing with them. The temperatures in the winters here in their grow space will drop to 14 degrees celsius which is well within their range of tolerance so now we're going to move on to light because i did touch upon my fertilizer regime and why i am cautious during their growing season if they choose to do so in winter based on light levels because they love their light no direct sun but super bright shade or dappled sun here in southern spain but even where they come from they want a lot of airflow and happy days outdoors I can provide for that so their location during the warmer months of the year is in my blooming alley whether they are in bloom or not but in that corner they will get the brightest of shade including dappled sun mid to late afternoon and that corner has a little climate of its own because the wind even if there's only just a breeze it swirls around in that little corner <laughs> and becomes rather windy <laughs> during the winter months of course I have to bring them inside for the night when the temperatures drop below 13 degrees Celsius and then they go on a shelf where they have space because they are big orchids even when not in bloom and I do try the light training for new growth to mature and always have the new growth facing in the opposite direction of the main light source so that the intention being the new growth will grow up and into the pot as opposed to come out at a perpendicular angle requiring more shelf space than they already need. But in the winter I do not supplement with artificial light. They get what they get. If I can bring them out during the day, if it is a sunny or overcast day, when I bring them inside they do not get any more supplemental light at all. And for that reason, I balance any new growths out with reduced amount of fertilizer just to support the growth, but I don't want that growth to bolt. So I cannot tell you how pleased I am to see a new growth on the Prismartocarpa because I can go gung-ho with the fertilizer and get as much energy into that growth before we go through the stressful times of late fall, winter, early spring. My Brassavole has not started a new growth, even though her spike is spent. So we'll have to wait and see if she gives me the opportunity to also get some strength into her before the winter comes. Clearly this is the time of year, late summer into early fall when they are in bloom. It takes forever though for the spikes to develop usually around two months and then another three weeks to watch the buds open up and the buds open randomly not in any order as in from the lowest to the top of the spike the blooms are everything i like about orchid blooms they are star shaped have that distinct lip which in truth really makes the whole bloom while the petals and sepals 
really resemble a brassavola bloom. What is amazing is that I have never had to support the spikes. And I say that because look at the length of them. They are strong in their own right. They grow bolt upright, giving a beautiful display. And they are super long lasting blooms as well. As I mentioned earlier, my brassavola is going over, but it has been in bloom for the past six weeks and maintained the freshness of the blooms during the roughest week of dry, warm wind without frazzling. But you can also see that the Prismartocarpa is a much larger orchid compared to the Brassavole. But this is not because she is a third time bloomer. Her first spike was just as generous. These orchids are just generous and they are prepared to grow and bloom and they are reliable. Panarica Brassavole is supposed to be lightly fragrant. Seeing as mine is a first time bloomer, maybe that is why I am not detecting any fragrance or it is so faint that it could be considered non-existent. The next blooming will give me a better idea if she is an actual fact fragrant or not and if not it doesn't really matter <laughs> at the end of the day moving them into the position in the blooming alley where i could appreciate a fragrance it would be a little bit cumbersome the prisma Carpa has never been fragrant for me so now we move into the subject of pests i would like to say that the only pests that one needs to look out for while new growths form and a spike starts to appear are mealybugs that is all i've had to deal with up until now scale etc has not made any appearance and thank goodness for that however you see the marks that i have on the new growth of the brassa volume it has those black spots the orchid came with those spots and i resorted to cutting the leaves off trying to get that under control as it was getting progressively worse from the moment she arrived until eventually i thought yeah no I'm gonna cut leaves off, which normally I'm not a fan of, but mm, I had to give it a try. The new growth did develop clean and I thought, woohoo, we're home and dry. And then the spots appeared on that new growth as well. So what is going on? And for now, my conclusion is that the lack of humidity has something to do with those black spots forming. And you can see it is also starting to happen on my Prismata Carpa. And this would be the first year that it is doing that. Earlier on, I mentioned a very, very dry period with very warm, consistent bashing winds, I would like to say. It is possible that my lack of humidity is causing these issues. I'm also having issues on the leaves with regards to cell collapse where you can see that some of the cells are struggling. I was looking at them thinking it could be thrips damage but I'm not really seeing the traces of thrips. It's more as if the cells just couldn't cope with the dry air. That is my conclusion for the time being. But if you know of anybody that grows panaricas and knows about what afflicts them based on environment or any possible fungus, please be so kind as to share my video and ask what is going on here because I cannot give you a concrete and definitive answer. For me, it is a lack of humidity. I have tried to treat every leaf religiously, consistently with garlic infused water that works as a fungicide. Clearly, it has not worked. But if this is all I have to deal with and as long as these spots aren't spreading to other orchids on the shelf or close by where these two live then I am a-okay with that. As long as it is isolated to these two then for me it is a lack of humidity. Please share the video I would appreciate it. I would love to know if I am wrong on the humidity levels and then how can I counteract and combat the spotting. I always comfort myself in moments like these that I am not growing orchids to take them to a show. Otherwise, I would be extremely upset and very annoyed that I'm not getting to the bottom of this problem. Let me also know if you grow panarica. What is your environment like, especially your humidity levels? And if you grow them indoors in a controlled environment or if they're just doing what orchids do, growing out in nature, having a great time. I would really appreciate your input on this genus because just like with Encyclias or Prostechias, they are reliable, vigorous and, well, beautiful. <laughs> If you have any questions of anything that I covered didn't cover enough, leave that in the comments as well. Be happy to go into further detail and address anything that I may have missed there. Thank you once again so much for being here. Your support is very much appreciated and I wish you a beautiful day on one condition though that you please stay safe. Take care. Bye.